fall of, of Rebecca since her days in the 90s at the... Um, <laughs> similar to this when we're on when we're on site so we don't wear stuff like this when we're in Bristol but when we're in um, like at the final four we wear something like this and um, it takes them forever to get it just right and so and all, all the wires and stuff have to go through your dress or through your shirt and um, and and put somewhere and if you want to be mobile if you want to get up and go to the bathroom then uh, the women will appreciate this you have to have the pack part hooked on your bra, um, because if it's hooked anywhere else, it gets a little cumbersome. So uh, anyway, I didn't plan on talking about that, but I didn't know I was going to be, uh, I was going to be wearing this. Um, hello. Uh, thank you for the wonderful parking spot outside. Um, I don't get parking like that when I'm in stores. Uh, I just have to drive around and find some place and hope that I don't get ticketed. So um, I'm here today, and, uh, and, and how much time do we have? Now right hour and a half. Well, I am certainly not going to talk for an hour and a half. Um, I've been to enough, ch enough church services to know the attention span is usually about 30 minutes listening to someone speak, um, but then I'm happy to take uh, any questions that anybody has about anything, because of course I want you to hear what you want to hear, and um, so I'll talk first and then, uh, and then take questions. But I figured since this coming Sunday is an important day, um, which my husband, I'm sure, has forgotten, um, <laughs> with it being Mother's Day, that um, a, a topic that I could talk about would be things my mother taught me. And um, she taught me a lot. And uh, my mother used to um, come to all the UConn basketball games, not only when I was playing, but after that. My mom passed away in 2011. Um, but the, the things she taught me, the messages she sent me, continue uh, to surround everything I do in my life. And um, so I figured I would share some of those uh, today. Now, first of all, some of you uh, have heard the saying, you know, for, when you're speaking, in order to not be nervous, to picture uh -oh. everyone making it. Um, so you're right there in the blue shirt. No, I'm just kidding. Um, now, yeah, <laughs> just the socks. Um, but, uh, but I never had to do that because I am used to people staring at me. I was, uh, I was six feet tall in the sixth grade. And um, that's extraordinarily tall for someone that age. And so, uh, especially at that age, I didn't welcome people looking at me the way they did. I was not comfortable as a, you know, 11-year-old walking around Holyoke Mall in Massachusetts and have people like, holy cow, <laughs> who is that really tall girl? But, um, but, but I've grown accustomed to it over the course of the last 30 plus years um, since I was that age. Um, so my mother taught me that you can be anything you want to be. And I think a lot of people have heard that. You can be anything you want to be. And when I was a little girl, what I really wanted to do was play basketball. Um, I have an older brother and an older sister. And uh, my older brother was six years older than me, is six years older than me. Um, and he played basketball from the time we were little. And I was the annoying tag along <laughs> sister who wanted to do everything that her brother was doing. And, and so I wanted, um, so I wanted to play basketball. And I was really lucky that my mom, um, she really supported that dream. There was no WNBA when I was a little girl. There was college basketball. They may have had two or three games a year on television. I don't mean two or three UConn games. Two or three games in general. Uh, maybe the semifinals or the final four in the national championship game. Those are the only games you could watch on TV. And often they were taped away. So you knew the result before you were even able to watch the telecast. But my mom completely supported um, what I wanted to do. So when I was about in third grade, um, I have a third grader now, eight years old, um, in our town you could sign up to play park and rec basketball. Now um, my daughter, who's eight years old, she signed up in our town this year. I live in a small town, Granby, Connecticut. It's not big at all. Um, 7,000 maybe? Uh, uh, but it's not a, a large town. And, and, and my eight-year-old daughter, my third-grade daughter, when she signed up to play basketball, she got put on a team, and I think there were five teams in her league, and it's just that age group. That's pretty good. When, when I signed up, and uh, where I grew up in Southwick, Massachusetts, I think it was about the same size as Granby, where I live. 
two girls signed up. <laughs> and so my mom got the phone call, we're sorry, Mrs. Lobler, there's not gonna be a girls team, Rebecca can't play. And my mom said, no, it just means you have to let her play on the boys team. <laughs> and, uh, and, and they did. And I went down for the first day, um, first day of practice, and the other girl chose not to play, so I was the only girl practicing on the all boys team. And uh, my mom, being my mom, said, you know, I want you to treat Rebecca the exact same way that you treat the boys. If you're yelling at them, you're yelling at her. If they're running sprints, she's running sprints. Um, the only exception is if uh, you go shirts and skins. <laughs> I would prefer she be, she be on the shirts too. Um, and then fast forward a little bit, um, when I was in fifth grade, now both of my parents were teachers. My dad, a high school teacher for his entire career, all of it spent in Granby, um, and, and then in the town where I live now. And then my mom, um, she was a fourth grade teacher and then a middle school guidance counselor, and she ended up finishing in high school as a guidance counselor. Anyway, uh, I'm in fifth grade. We got report cards three or four times a year. And um, you know, this is back before, like when I check my kids' grades now, I just have to go on the computer and, uh, and I see how they're doing in their classes. There's like updated every week progress reports. When it's time to get the report cards, they don't even send them home or you know, with the child anymore. You just go on and you can print them out or see them right there. Well, when I was a kid, um, you know, the only way you got your report card is your teacher handed it to you. So how our teacher did it when I was in fifth grade, she had her desk up at the front and then all the kids were handed a busy work assignment. She'd call us up one by one, and she would hand us our report card and then talk to us about it. Well, um, both of my parents were teachers, so my grades were completely, that, that was the most important thing to them. They made sure to know, my, my brother, my sister, and myself, that we had to get good grades. That was the bottom line. Um, so I was a good student. My teacher pulled me up and, and handed me my report card, and she said, Rebecca, I'm, um, I'm worried about you. I'm really worried about you, and I'm concerned about you. <laughs> And um, I was a little confused, and she said, uh, you need to dress more like a girl. Um, she said, and you need to act more like a girl. Now, I went to public school, and what I would wear to school was jeans, sneakers, and a t-shirt. Because at, at recess, I'm outside running around and playing soccer with the boys, or playing football, or playing whatever they were playing. That's what I was doing. Um, and then at, at, at lunchtime, we got to choose where we sat, and usually in the cafeteria, there's a long table where the boys sat and a long table where the girls sat. And I would sit with the boys because those are the kids I was playing with when I was out at recess. So my teacher, uh, you need to act more like a girl and you need to dress more like a girl. You're the only girl who plays with all the boys at recess and you're the only girl who sits with all the boys at lunch. Um, when I think about it now, I was like, I was just way, way ahead of my time. <laughs> So I went home that day on the school bus and I got home a little bit before my, before my mom did. And when she came in, she, of course she's a teacher, she knew it was report card day, let me see your report card, pleased with the grades. And then I told her what happened and told her what my teacher said and I had tears in my eyes. Um, and my mother absolutely lost her mind. She was furious. And, and I was, you know, I was a 10 year old kid and, and I remember her saying, get your stuff and get in the car right now. Um, in a much angrier tone. <laughs> and, and I was sitting, I, can, I, I will never forget this memory, sitting on the floor in the kitchen looking up at her and being terrified, not of her, but of going back and, and what she was going to do when we got to school. Get in the car. So I got in the car and we drove all the way down to the school. We got there and fortunately, the teacher wasn't there. <laughs> and I say fortunately, it was fortunately for the teacher. Um, because my mother was, uh, was not happy. And uh, the principal was there and she spoke to the principal and what they ended up doing was taking me out of that class. Which is not at all what my mother wanted because she said, Rebecca hasn't done anything wrong. Why does she have to be taken out of the class? It's the teacher who's done something wrong and I wanna make sure that something happens, um, that something happens there. So. Um, but the bigger thing to me was the message it sent to me as a little kid. You know, it doesn't matter how you dress. It doesn't matter what you wear. It doesn't matter who you're playing with at recess. Are you doing the right things? Are you a good kid? Are you getting the, the grades in school that you're supposed to be? And, um, and that was a huge message to me. And it's, it's interesting because I, when I've told this story before, I've had many um, women who are my age or older say that they had similar conversations with teachers um, or adults. And, and kind of uh, authority figures in their life. And um, it's not a conversation I imagine any of my daughters would ever have 
uh, that anyone would ever have with my daughters. Um, but if they did, yeah, I would, uh, I would, I would act like my mother did. So um, anyway, my mother told me, you know, you can be anything you want to be. Um, her one exception is, except a Yankee fan. <laughs> uh, you can't be one of those. See, now depending on where I am in Connecticut, that gets different reactions. Um, so, uh, so contrast that figure in my life, see, telling me I can be anything uh, I want to be with um, my college coach, uh, Coach Oriyama, who would, um, a couple of my fa the favorite things that he called me, this is in particular my freshman and sophomore years, one of the things he called me regularly was, you are the worst post player in America. <laughs> and, uh, okay, awesome. Um, and then my favorite, which I'm still slightly confused about, was, um, you are the dumbest smart person <laughs> And uh, I have to say one of the things I've enjoyed over the course of the last, however long I've been covering the team, maybe 15 or 20 years, is to uh, attend practices on occasion or talk to some players. And um, Tina Charles, has also been the worst post player in America. Uh, Stephanie Olson was the worst post player in America. Brandon Stewart, I believe, was also one of the worst post players in America. So, um, so perhaps Coach Aramba is one of the dumbest smart people in America. Because he recruited us all, and he hasn't come up with anything new to call um, Anyway, um, my mother, again, told me you can be anything you want to be. And, um, and because of that, I dreamed of becoming a basketball player. And so some amazing things happened in my life that I never expected. I certainly never expected when I was a fifth grade or a third grade girl. Um, so we're gonna fast forward a bunch of years from that time to um, one day waking up, getting in a car, pulling up um, to the front of the White House to get out and go for a job with President Clinton. Um, when you win the national championship, um, or at least for a long time, when you won a national championship, um, you'd get invited to, to the White House to meet the president. And so that happened for our 1995 team. And um, the entire team got to go, and it was President Clinton at the time, except I couldn't go because um, the visit to the White House happened at the, the exact same weekend that they were having tryouts for the national team that would eventually become the Olympic team in 1996. So I was in Colorado Springs, trying out for the national team. I don't know, maybe it was uh, April, May, so, I mean, sometime in the spring, so I missed the visit to the White House. Um, but the, the reaches of the Yukon community are far and wide, and so somehow, because I didn't get to go, I was later invited and, uh, and got to go and, and, and run with President Clinton. And, and this was back before 9-11, so you could actually drive the car, you had to stop at a security gate, but you would drive and pull right up to the front of the White House, into a semicircle right in front of the White House. It's maybe seven in the morning, it was early. Go in, and at one point, President Clinton is coming down the stairs. He's wearing the 1995 National Champion <laughs> hat um, that our team had given him when they visited, and he's you know, kind of wiping sleep from his eyes. And he came down and he said, you know, I'm sorry, I'm a little tired. I was up late waiting for Chelsea to get home from a date. And, uh, especially as a kid, or, you know, you're like, oh yeah, I guess they're also a human being and a father too. Um, Gosh, that's weird. Um, so anyway, there was uh, three of us that were scheduled to, to jog with the president. It was myself and, uh, and, and I think two members of the military that were retiring um, in some capacity. So anyway, we get into these vans and head out um, to a park uh, a few miles away and the president gets into his limo and we meet out there. And, um, and you know, we start going for our jog. It was a three mile jog. And about the halfway point, there was a big statue and, we stop and uh, you know the president kind of describes the history of the statue and I remember thinking at the time this is kind of nice to stop but I bet he's a little bit tired <laughs> and um, and when I told the story two people have said you know could, could, at the time you were an elite level athlete could the president keep up with you and, um, just if you run with the president you let him set the pace <laughs> that's that's my piece of advice to all of you and, uh, and so as we were coming around the, the, the latter part of the run um, there were uh, there were a group of people there, and I don't know, maybe 20 of them, and you realize um, there's all members of the media. And as we're jogging by, they're starting to yell questions to the president, but you know, not like silly questions about us being out on a jog, but uh, real important, you know, policy kind of questions. And we just go by, and he, he doesn't say a word until we're just out of earshot. And uh, he says, and I never answer their questions. <laughs> and, uh, and we keep going. And, and uh, 
And actually, maybe I was um, one of the dumbest smart people in America at the time, because I do remember when we got there, thinking like, wow, there's a lot of people out here bird watching. <laughs> there's a bunch of guys with binoculars. And, uh, and you look a little closer and see that they all have weapons, and you realize, Secret Service, uh, that's a little bit different. Um, so anyway, we're, we're done with the job. This is at, it was sometime in uh, early to mid-July, and, uh, and stretching or whatever. And the president said, you know, would the three of you like to ride back with me in the limo? <laughs> so we get in the limo and we're driving back to the White House. And um, again, there's four people who've just been on a jog in the middle of July in Washington, D.C. <laughs> it's hot and we're sweating. And uh, as we're kind of like going around DuPont Circle, I remember looking around and seeing that all of the windows were all fogged up. <laughs> and uh, just thinking at the time, this can't look particularly good. Um, and this was long before, well not long before, but before the whole Monica Lewinsky scene. Oh, yeah. But then after that it would have been even worse. Um, we got back to the White House and he brought us into the Oval Office. He was giving us a personal tour. And this is as aides are coming in like, you know, you're way behind on your schedule. You've actually got things to do. Um, he's taking us to the side office and we're getting a chance to see all of this. And uh, again, because my mom said, you know, you can be whatever you want to be. So now we're going to fast forward uh, a couple more years. And, um, and at this point, the WNBA has started. The WNBA started in 1997. So my timing in life as a woman could not have been any better. I was, uh, Title IX was passed in 1972. I was uh, born in 1973 in terms of my basketball life. I, I'm a senior in 1995 when UConn wins the championship, go right into the national team. 1996, the Olympics are in Atlanta. We win a gold medal. WNBA is starting 1997. This could not have been laid out in a more perfect timeline for me, and I'm very aware of that and appreciate all of that. So this is um, the 1997-1998 WNBA has what you know WNBA.com. This is when dot coms are kind of getting a little bit um, you know bigger, and, and I'm contributing as a writer to um, to what they're doing. Anyway, at some point, um, somebody from the White House got in touch with the WNBA and said, you know, we see that Rebecca's really active in what you're doing um, on the internet, uh, that President Clinton is going to do a um, press conference in East Palo Alto. He has an initiative to get internet into low-income communities. Would Rebecca be willing to come and um, be part of that press conference? So the only thing is, because of, um, because of the nature of it, we can't pay for her flight to get out there. So they asked me this, I said, of course, I'd be happy to come out and be a part of that. I'd be honored to. So uh, maybe a week later, I get a call and I said, okay, after the press conference in East Palo Alto, President Clinton is going to do another press conference later that day on a Native American reservation in New Mexico. Would Rebecca be willing to do that? This is the only catch. There's no way you can get there on a commercial flight from East Palo Alto, so she'd have to go on Air Force One. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, sure, I'm, I'll buy my ticket to East Palo Alto, and, uh, and my, my tax dollars can pay for my ticket to uh, the Native Reservation. So, um, so anyway, I get out to East Palo Alto, we do the press conference, we get into President's motorcade, so that's the way to travel, by the way. <laughs> uh, we get to the, the airfield, and um, I said to somebody, I said, how do I know where to sit on Air Force One? Like, I'm really used to, you know, the A, B, and C boarding pass on Southwest <laughs> Airlines, but I don't know where to go. And they said, don't worry, when you get on the plane, there will be a sign with your name on it. So I get on the plane. Now, for Air if anybody's seen the movie Air Force One, at least the plane then looked exactly like that. I don't know how many different versions of the plane have happened since that time, but that's exactly what it looked like. And there's the entrance in the front and the entrance in the back, and I learned that day that only the president uses the entrance in the front. So. Everybody else gets, you know, scurries onto the back of the plane. So I get on the plane, and again, the uh, the reach of the Yukon community. Uh, a flight attendant, although I don't think that's what they're called in Air Force One, um, but he pulls me aside. He said, Rebecca, I'm a huge Yukon fan. He said, when we get up in the air, he said, I'm not supposed to do this too often. But when we get up, he said, would you like a tour of the plane? Said, yeah, I'd like a tour of the plane. So then I'm, I'm walking around, and I'm looking for the sign. And so finally I get to this big leather chair, 
with a sign on it, and it says Air Force, it has got the President's seal, Air Force One welcomes Ms. Lobo. <laughs> and um, I sit down, and I'm just thinking, I gotta take this all in. Uh, literally, I took that and put it in my bag. And uh, in the seat pocket in front of me, there was an entertainment guide that showed the movies and the food that we were gonna get on the flight. Boop. And, uh, pretty much, if it, if it had the President's seal on it, and it wasn't considered stealing, it was in my bag. So, I'm sitting there, these big comfy leather seats, and how it was on the plane, the very back of the plane on one side was all, was the members of the Secret Service um, and uh, the Air Force, and then on the other side, near the bathrooms I've noted, um, especially to my husband, is where the media members were seated. Um, my husband's a member of the media. Uh, and, then, and then a little forward where we were sitting, um, and each seat, because this is before everybody had cell phones, I think the thing back in the late 90s that you know you might have was a pager, yeah. um, but uh, but not everybody had cell phones. But there were in in the, in on Air Force One, every seat had a phone, but it didn't have numbers to dial. You picked up the phone and you got the Air Force One operator, mm -hmm. and uh, you give her a number to call and a name. And when that person answered, she would say. This is the Air Force One operator. You have a call from Ms. Lobo. <laughs> um, so, also because there weren't cell phones, that back in those days when you actually dialed phones, yeah. you knew people's numbers in your brain. <laughs> so every person's number that I remembered, Jen Rosati was one of my best friends on that team. Pam Weber was my roommate. My, at work, my parents, I called every single person. <laughs> And as God is my witness, not a single one of them was phones. <laughs> and the worst part of it is, the Air Force One uh, operator won't leave a message. They're not there. And I'm like, just leave a message. Say, this is the Air Force One operator. But she won't do that. So anyway, we get up, we get to, I guess, our cruising altitude. And, uh, and the flight attendant comes in front and says, you want to go on the tour? I want to go on the tour. And I had a camera. Uh, Again, it wasn't a phone, so it was actually a sh -sh -sh, like advanced camera. And uh, so, so uh, the, we had the area where we were. We went a little bit um, more forward in the plane, and then and there was kind of a decent-sized conference room. There was an important meeting happening. No idea what was being said, but it was happening on Air Force One, so of course it was important. Um, a little more forward, I, I look in. There's a kind of a big office. There's a carpet on the floor. The president's seal behind a big oak desk. I look up and. You know, looking over his cheaters is President Clinton, who's uh, you know making changes uh, to the speech he's going to be giving in, um, in at the Native Reservation. He just looked at the, you know, Re Rebecca. Thanks for joining us. I'm thinking, my pleasure. <laughs> um, keep going forward, and in the very front of the plane is where the president's quarters are. So in there, there's a bed with a blanket with the president's seal. Um, another area. And then right next to that was a bathroom. And in the bathroom, there was a full shower. And hanging over the shower was like a steamer. I guess in case see it's closed, get wrinkly. And, uh, and a toilet. And, uh, and I'm taking, you know, throughout the plane, I'm taking a variety of pictures. And the flight attendant said to me, Rebecca, do you want me to take your picture sitting on the president's toilet? <laughs> and uh, I said, no. <laughs> So are you kidding? He so said, that's the picture everybody wants. And I said, you must give this tour a lot more to men than you do to women. Um, but then I have to say, the first time my husband heard me tell that story, he looked at me with just sheer disgust. And he said, you turn down the chance of every picture taken sitting on the president's toilet. And, um, and I did. And actually, that, if I had a PowerPoint, if I had that picture, that would probably have been um, so anyway, so be, you can be anything you want to be. So I'm running with the president. I'm, I'm doing that. A couple of years later, this is actually quite a few years later, I find myself at the White House for a Christmas party. This is when President Bush is in office. And uh, my husband and I are there. And my husband decides that the one thing we need to do, and, and how, it, how the Christmas party is, is in each room, like in the blue room or the red room, there's a theme. And there's a Christmas tree. And it's decorated based on that theme. And, uh, my husband has this, this idea, he said, uh, I think we need to sit in every chair in the rooms. Like, okay, why? Um, and he said, because you never know if we're gonna be back here. So he said, I'm never gonna be back at the White House, let's sit in every chair, all right, let's sit in every chair. So we go around, I'm sitting in the different chairs, and, uh, and in one of the rooms they have, um, you know, they have a bar, and they have a buffet, and, uh, 
So my husband goes over, he's like, well, of course I have to order Sam Adams. And, um, and so as he's drinking the beer, he just looks at me and says, oh, these are our tax dollars at work. <laughs> and, um, and so, so I have this amazing time. Um, I'm gonna fast forward again to uh, uh, when our oldest daughter was five years old, she's in kindergarten. And uh, she's in the living room and I come in and she's watching a PBS documentary on, um, on the White House and, and uh, the structure in, in the room of the White House. And I came in and I said, oh, uh, my oldest daughter, Siobhan. I said, Siobhan, Daddy and I were there. She said, I know. He, we watched this, some of this together the other night. I said, oh, okay. And she said, and he told me he tooted in that chair. <laughs> Awesome. I said, um, well, make sure you don't tell your kindergarten teacher that, that, part, uh, that part of the story. So fast forward however many more years, and I'm um, back in the White House, and this time it was with President Obama, and uh, when he would fill out the brackets, come March Madness, he's the first president uh, to fill out the brackets. And the first year in office, he filled out the men's bracket, um, but he didn't fill out the women's bracket well. He heard about that. And, uh, and so the, the next seven years, he filled out the women's bracket, and I was able to be the person from ESPN who went and filled uh, the bracket out with him um, for, for the last three years. And uh, it was a great experience. You'd go in, and, and each year that I was there, we were in the math room, and, uh, and ESPN kind of takes over. We've got the lighting people, the sound people, the people who just want to be there because it's the White House people. Um, and there's a lot of people there. And, and, and President Obama would come in, and Andy Katz was the person from ESPN who he would fill out the men's side with. And, and uh, anyway, you, so you're there all morning, and uh, you know at some point you get a, a bracket. All right, this is the president's bracket. And then on occasion it was like, oh wait, he's changed it. You know, they'd, they'd send another one down. And uh, he'd come in, and we'd have some. Uh, Idle chit chat. One of the years he came in, and he's uh, and I'd seen online that the day before, uh, Lin Manuel Miranda, who wrote Hamilton, was at the White House, and uh, and so I was talking to the president about that, and um, and he said how he had gone to see uh, to see Hamilton soon before that, and I said, Are you no problem getting tickets? <laughs> and he said, he said even better. He said the understudy played Hamilton. He said so I got to sit next to Lynn to, oh, to watch the show. Oh, so anyway, these are the parts of, the, um, of my visit to the White House that, that I loved, and then we filled out the bracket. Um, <laughs> but he would be funny because he'd say, Rebecca, I haven't followed the women quite as closely as the men, so fill in some of the blanks for me. Well, he still knew the women's game pretty darn well. And, uh, and he was smart enough each year that I was there to choose UConn. So, uh, <laughs> so he was, generally speaking, um, Pretty accurate with uh, with all of that. Um, excuse me as I look down. Uh, uh, yes. So my mother. So these are the things that happened to me because um, because she told me I could be uh, whatever I wanted to be. So another lesson that I learned from my mom is that through everything, no matter how tough it is, you have to have a sense of humor. You have to have a sense of humor. And, uh, and she was the absolute queen of that, that no matter what tough things were happening in her life, you'd have to figure out a way to have a sense of humor. And, uh, and I learned this from the time I was a little girl. Now, I'm gonna describe my dad. My dad is still alive. My dad goes to all of the UConn women's games at the XL Center. I still call it the Civic Center. I have a hard time with the XL part. So, so he still goes. So my dad, 6'5", he used to be 6'5". He's a, little, he's a little shorter than me now. I'm 6'4", 6'5". Um, Jet black hair. All the time I was growing up, um, you know, black mustache, and uh, and especially when I was a kid, the style was you know like the the thick rimmed glasses. That when it, it got sunny, that the, the tint would turn to sunglasses. And as my mom used to describe it, he, my dad has a generous nose. <laughs> so that's the setup for the story. So I'm in. I'm playing little league. Um, my, all of my kids right now are in the midst of Little League, and um, so I sort of want to say to my parents, sorry about that, because like eight-year-old softball, when they're supposed to pitch, <laughs> I'm like, go Rosie, go Rosie, like, is this game ever going to end? <laughs> and, you know, anyway, I'm, I'm playing Little League, and my dad is, is watching, and, uh, and my mom's with him, and she sees a couple of little boys, I think they're maybe around 10 years old, and uh, my dad doesn't notice them because he 
He's a man and they don't know as much. Um, <laughs> but uh, he doesn't know some, but these two little boys like scurry over. They're looking up quizzically at my dad who's sitting in the bleachers. And then they scurry away. And then my mom said, a little bit later, scurry back over and they're looking at him quizzically. And they scurry away. And I think they did it one more time. Until finally, at one point they come over, my dad takes off his glasses and he's cleaning off the lenses with his shirt. And, uh, and right when he does that, one of the boys says to the other boy, see, I told you it was a real nose. <laughs> story and um, my dad would take off his glasses. Um, so my, my junior year when I was at UConn, 1994, this is when the women's basketball program was really starting to um, starting to ascend and get attention. And um, it was in December of 1993, actually, my junior year, where my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. And uh, we just had a big win. We're getting near the pavilion. I'm still in my uniform, sweaty, stinky, the whole thing. And, uh, and she pulls me aside, the, the, the arena had cleared out, um, you know, been talking to the media, whatever, she pulled me aside and she said, uh, Rebecca, I just wanted to let you know, you need to know, I was diagnosed, I found a lump in my breast and it was cancerous. Um, I've been diagnosed with breast cancer. And, uh, and I just started, as any oh. kid would, you just start crying and crying. And she said, listen, what I need from you is, I've got enough to worry about, I can't worry about you, I need you to continue to go to class and get your grades, I need you to continue to practice and work really hard in the basketball court. I need to focus on these things, and I need you to focus on those things. Everything is going to be okay. And she said, besides, your dad's not a breast man anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Which was way, 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 way more than I, uh, than I, ever, than I ever needed to know. Um, so in my senior year, because my mom was going through a treatment, she had, um, she had a wig. And, um, and she, to tell the story about uh, a fan at the UConn games would come over and just say, Mrs. Lobo, I wanted to let you know how much I love your new hairstyle. <laughs> it is beautiful. And my mom just kind of downplaying it, well, thank you very much. No, I, I can't tell you how, how nice your hairstyle is. It's absolutely beautiful. My mom again trying to downplay it. And, uh, and then the woman finally saying, can you please tell me where, um, where you went to get your hairstyle? And so finally my mom just had to say, listen, I, I'm undergoing treatment for something and this is a wig. And she said the look on the woman's face was priceless and she scurried away. Um, so it's not really a funny story about that person, but at least my mother found, my mother found uh, the humor in it. Um, now when, when I had, um, I, I started working, going back to work after my oldest daughter uh, wasn't even a year old. And um, as any working mom knows, the only way you can do that is if you have tremendous support. And one of the people who supported me and helped me was my mom. And, uh, and especially when my, my kids, because um, I, I nursed, so if I was gonna be gone for a number of days, I had to bring that child with me. So um, I was in Cleveland because the Women's Final Four was there. I think this may have been a rare year where you kind of was not playing. Um, <laughs> But I, mean, I wasn't there working the Final Four, but the WNBA draft was right after the Final Four and I was there working the WNBA draft. And I had my oldest with me, who uh, I don't think was quite one years old, and my mom came too to help me take care, of, take care of my daughter. So anyway, we're staying in Cleveland and the hotel we were in was attached to a mall out there. And um, one of the things you can do when it's cold outside with a little kid is pushing them around in a stroller and, uh, and around the mall. So that's what my mom was doing, you know, just window shopping as she's pushing them around. Pushing her around, and she gets back to the room, and she is just like beside herself. She can't even speak because she's laughing so hard. And I said, "Mom, what's going on?" And she said, "Somewhere, as I'm doing laps in the mall, she said, I lost my prosthesis." <laughs> and uh, she said, "And all I've been thinking about is if I go back to find it, and I go into the stores where I've been in." How do I ask for such a thing? <laughs> How do I ask if anyone's found anything that looks like this along, along, you know, in the mall? So anyway, finally, when she gets herself together and starts, stops giggling and we take uh, my, my daughter out of the stroller, we realize that it had actually fallen into the stroller. So the only thing better than my mom going into uh, at a 
don't know what, what, what would have been a good store to ask about. Is it, you know, the, the little baby was like, you know, as, we're, as we're going through. Um, so anyway, she was able to find humor in every situation. And, and I'm really lucky in that the, the man I married um, can also find humor in every situation. And if it's not there, he puts it there. Uh, he's a very, very funny guy. And, um, and my husband has also had to learn what it's like to be married to me while we live in this state. And um, it's, it's interesting where I live in Grammy. Even though I grew up in Southwick, Massachusetts, which if you look at the border of Mass, there's it's straight, the southern border, except for one little dip. <laughs> that one little dip is my town. And so I feel like sort of you're part of Connecticut. You're at least being hugged by Connecticut when you grow up there. Um, and, and my parents taught in Grammy, right uh, just south of uh, Southwick, which is the town I live in now. So it's good. I love it because when I go to, I, I'm at the grocery store far too often. I've got four kids. I'm there a lot. Um, I know all the people there. Thank you, Stop and Shop, for no longer being on strike. Because um, I, I just, they feel like they're all my friends. But when I'm in Stop and Shop in the wintertime, I get stopped frequently. And it's people that talk to me about the Yukon women's team. And the only thing I get stopped um, to talk about more in that area is people who stop me and say, your mom or your dad was my teacher. And uh, they had this impact on my life. And what's great about it too is, especially since my mom passed away, I frequently, um, pe people will speak to me, your mom was my teacher, and then they tell me a story about her that I'd never heard before. And it's such a great way to keep her alive um, to me. So anyway, in Connecticut, um, everyone, for the most part, unless they've got something wrong with them, are you kind of always basketball. <laughs> and, um, and so, being a 6'4 woman, people are gonna look at me twice anyway, but if they look at me twice, here, they might say, okay, I remember her from UConn. Anyway, so my husband is married to me in this state. So this is years ago um, when there was still a WNBA team in Sacramento. And I was out in Sacramento calling a WNBA game. And the WNBA season goes from the end of May. It's usually like late, um, Memorial Day to Labor Day. Uh, now it goes a little bit longer than that, but it's opposite the college season. Anyway, it was sometime in June. I was out in Sacramento and uh, there's a ring, a knock at our door, and uh, my husband answers the door. And standing in front of him are about 15 to 20 high school age girls, mostly, and like a 22, 23 year old guy. So he answers the door, and um, one of the kids says, we're on a church, a scavenger hunt for our church. We have to have our picture with someone famous. Is she home? <laughs> and, uh, and just to set this up a little better, my husband has been a writer for Sports Illustrated for the last 30 years. And when this particular um, knock came on our door, uh, he was writing a weekly column in Sports Illustrated. His picture was with his weekly column. So for people who read that, they might have considered him worthy of having a picture with his <laughs> So anyway, well, we're having, we, we need a picture with someone famous at your home. And, and my husband just laughed and said, you know, if you mean Rebecca. Um, <laughs> no, she's not. She's in Sacramento. So as he's standing there, a debate starts happening in front of him. And one of the girls says, well, let's get our picture with him. He's sort of famous. <laughs> and, um, and let me step back. I described my father to you. Let me, let me describe my, uh, my husband. My husband's a little taller than me. He's 6'5". He's, uh, um, he's seven years older than I am. He's bald as can be. He has been bald yeah. since his early 30s. A very handsome bald man. I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, anyway, the girl's in front of him. Um, well, you know, let's get our picture with him. He's sort of famous. He might count. And, uh, and the leader of the group, no, he won't. <laughs> and then another girl, no, you know, he might count. No, he won't. And so my husband's just standing there on his front step <laughs> while a bunch of teenagers debate whether or not he's worth having a picture with. <laughs> so finally, the leader of the group relents and says, all right, we can get our picture with him, but he's only famous for being her dad. <laughs> right? <laughs> and when he told me this story, of course I pointed out like, my dad's got a full head of jet black hair. <laughs> Now, my kids, um, nothing impresses my kids about me because I'm their mom. Um, and uh, the only thing I've ever done that they've seen is that they think is a little bit cool, and it was only when they were a, cer were a certain age, is that I got to play basketball with Big Bird on Sesame Street. <laughs> and uh, when, they, when they were young and saw that, they'd be like, all right, that one's okay. 
<laughs> so uh, to the point where my, my oldest daughter, uh, she's a freshman in high school now. Uh, oh, no. I, um, I co my, my, at my kid's school, you can start playing basketball in second grade. Maybe not for long. It doesn't really resemble what we think of as basketball, but it's so fun, it's delightful. Um, so I, I coached all my kids, including my oldest, starting in second grade all the way through eighth grade. Well, when my, when my oldest, Siobhan, was in, I think, sixth or seventh grade, she chose to also play on a, a team in our town that I did not coach, which I thought was great. She needed to have experience getting coached by someone other than me. So she's out in the driveway one day, and she's working on a post move. And she's, she's like, you know, stepping and dribbling really high, and I said, Siobhan, I said, I love that you're working on a post move, but if you're gonna do that move, you should dribble low, dribble the ball between your legs, and, and go up strong so you don't get the ball taken away. She said, Mom, Coach D taught me to do it this way. You dribble high, you do this, you do this. I said, okay. I said, but it's a post move, so if you're gonna do that move, this is how you do it. And I break it down, she's fighting me. No, Coach D said to do it this way. Finally, I said, Siobhan, Coach D is a 5'8 orthodontist. <laughs> same daughter, you may have heard this story before, this is my same daughter, when um, right around the same time where she was watching the, the uh, White House tour on PBS, um, I was away in March, because it's March Madness, I was away covering women's games, and uh, my husband was watching a UConn men's game um, in our living room, and my daughter came in, and she looked up at the TV and said, but Daddy, are those boys playing basketball? And he said, yeah. And she said, I didn't know boys played basketball. <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, which made me think my work here is done. <laughs> I, uh, my, my last lesson that my mother taught us was um, to always cherish your faith, family, faith, family, and friends. Uh, even through the course of her diagnosis, she always chose to live by faith instead of fear and, um, and taught us how to do that the best we could. Um, sometimes it's hard for me, I, I mentioned being a working mom, sometimes it's hard um, because you miss stuff with your kids. Um, you know, I'll never forget getting home from a WNBA game, and I think it was my second daughter, and my sister had been at home, um, had been at our house helping my husband, and she said, um, me, you crawled while you were gone. Uh, and I said, oh, I knew she was close. And, uh, and my husband said, yeah, but your sister was like, the one dangling like a rattle to get her to come over. What are you doing? You're supposed to, you know, not let her walk. So there are things, there are things that I missed. But um, one of my favorite recent ones was uh, I had been gone quite a bit during the WNBA finals. It was, um, it was in the fall, and my youngest is eight now. But this is when she was in kindergarten. She's five years old, and um, and she I was putting her to bed, and uh, she wanted to show me a, a drawing she had done at school. And the, the title at the top of the page just said, who lives with you? And there was a blank page. And she said, she said Mom, and of course she's five years old. It's stick figure. She said, there's Daddy, there's Siobhan, there's me, there's Thomas, there's Jesse. Jesse's our dog. And then she looked at me and she said, I forgot you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. That made me feel really good. I think I had to fly back out the next day to go somewhere else. And then um, this, same, this same daughter, this is my one who, ooh. She's funny, and, and when she's older, she may be trouble. Um, <laughs> hopefully in all the right ways. Uh, I, I was, again, I had come home from work, and I had a piece of jewelry on, and, um, and I think putting her to bed. And, uh, and she said, Mommy, I really like that necklace. And uh, I said, oh, thank you. Can I have it when you go to heaven? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I said, first, I like your assumption of where I'm going to go. <laughs> I do appreciate that, but um, yes, and uh, hopefully that won't be for a really, really long time. Um, so, uh, so I don't know the, the men in here. How many men here are with their wives? Got some. All right. So I'm sure all of you have great plans for Sunday. Um, I, I remember when uh, when my kids were little. My so I have four, and they're all two years apart. And um, so it's really hard when you have a, a bunch of little kids and they're really young. And and I remember the first maybe four, five, nine Mother's Days after I had children, and my husband would say, "What do you want?" And I'd say, "Do you honestly know what I want?" 
what do you want? I said, I want a couple hours in my house where none of you are here. <laughs> That's really all I want. And, uh, and, and I, I don't think I ever got it. Um, so, so this year, my husband, my husband is wonderful. He's a loving, caring, funny, awesome man. He's could be one of the worst gift givers ever. Um, <laughs> I remember one year, I think it was Valentine's Day, and he gave me um, a box of truffles. And I like chocolate, but I don't particularly like truffles. And um, so I didn't say anything because what kind of wife gets chocolate and tells her husband she doesn't like that? Well, then the following, my following birthday, the following October, he gave me truffles again. So this is the kind of wife. I said, I really, really appreciate that your thoughtfulness you gave me, you gave me these, but I just want you to know, because hopefully we're married a long time, <laughs> so, uh, I guess it would have been six months later, Valentine's Day comes, he gave me truffles. <laughs> and, like, a few more times after that, until finally I said, Steve, this has been a couple of years now, I told you a couple of years ago, I don't like truffles. And at this point, because I told him, now I'm getting annoyed. And, uh, and he does like truffles, which, by the way, man, he was crazy. <laughs> and he said to me, he said, he said, Oh, I couldn't remember if you said you did like truffles or you didn't like truffles, so I just catch the truffles and I'm like, oh, good heavens. All right, so at some point we'll listen. So anyway, so this makes sense now. So a couple weeks ago, I see this cute little, an advertisement for a cute little necklace, nothing expensive. It's like kind of a block thing, four size, where you can get your kids' names engraved on them. So I said, that's something I would wear. I would really like that. It's not expensive. So I screenshotted it, sent it to my husband and said, this would make a nice Mother's Day gift. Th that's what it's resorted to for me. So I had a speech, so I said, nice but um, my eight-year-old kind of came home yesterday. She said, I got your Mother's Day present in my bag. I said, and she hates to wait for things. And I said, I am so looking forward to opening that, but you better not, better not give me a hint until Sunday, because I cannot wait to open it on Sunday. She does the same thing to me at Christmas. I've got your present. No, you can Can you open it early? I will not open it early, because I know you're father's gift isn't going to be any good, so I have to have something to look forward to my kids. And, um, and it's great now because our Christmas tree, it's all homemade ornaments. It's all the kid, things the kids made, and my grandmother used to make a lot of um, actually beautiful ornament, ornaments um, that she would make, and so that's what our tree is. Ornaments made by my grandmother, some of the ornaments I made as a kid, and some of the ornaments that um, my kids have made. So anyway, husbands, or if you're daughters or whatever, um, you know, give your, give your uh, give some thought to whether or not you, the special woman in your life actually likes truffles or doesn't like truffles <laughs> or wants that time home alone. But, uh, but yeah, so, so the Sunday being Mother's Day is something I reflect on. I miss my mom a ton, um, but she taught me so many important things. And, and the number one being, be whatever you want to be, you never know what's going to happen. And uh, you never know if someday you'll be talking to the CLIR uh, <laughs> over at the Depot campus. But, um, anyway, I want to open it up to questions now. If anybody has any questions, uh, I'd love to answer them. So I'm I'm six four. My husband's six five. My um my oldest is fourteen. She's a very she's a young freshman. She was born on Christmas morning. Oh, um, oh my goodness. So of course it wasn't my doctor who was there to grab her. Um, but uh, she's about six two. Oh, wow. And uh, wow. and I think she I think she's about done growing. She may have a little more in her. Um, but I don't think she'll be taller than me. And then um, her sister, who's in seventh grade, it's still a little hard to tell. I don't I think she'll be around six feet. I have one boy, he's in fifth grade, and he's he's big, so I think he's gonna be really tall, I just don't know how tall. And then same thing with my eight-year-old. Um, and they like to play all sports. They play, uh, this time of year, they're little league, uh, baseball, and uh, in the fall, they play soccer, and in the winter, they play basketball. I've always wondered and been impressed that Gino has been just so constantly getting winners and motivating, and having the greatest team ever, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. So can you just give us some idea as to what do you think it is that has made him such a great coach and such great players? Sure. He, um, he, is, he knows how to be demanding in a way that others don't. Like he knows how to get the most out of you um, by make, always making situations really, really hard 
where you're not only physically exhausted, but you're mentally exhausted. You're done. You don't. You can't listen to one more. You can't. You know. He prepares you so that if you're in a game and you're physically exhausted and a call goes against you, so therefore mentally you're, you've been through that because you've been listening to him while you're completely wiped, tell you, no, you have to do it again, you have to do it again, and while calling you the worst post player in America and, and those sorts of things. But he makes you want to do well for him at the same time. Um, he's a really, really good people person. He really reads people well. and. Um, and he cares, he really, really cares about his players. And eventually you figure that out. And, um, and you just, he, and, and his, um, the way his practices are, and I thought this was just how they, they were everywhere until I went and played professionally. And especially now, doing what I do, covering women's college basketball, I watch a lot of practices. No one is as precise um, as he is. You have to know there's a right way and there's a wrong way. And being a foot to the left is a wrong way. It's not okay to be close to doing it. You have to do it right every single time. And um, and other people aren't that particular. And other people, if you know, UConn, everything they do at the beginning of the practice, say you're doing a layup drill. You're going, well, you have to make 12 in a row. If you miss one, it goes back to zero. Because just like in a game, every layup is gonna matter. And um, and he, his precision and, and how demanding he is, while at the same time you know that he really cares about you, is different from anything I've ever seen, even from other great coaches. It's, it's just different. Is, is there praise involved? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or is it, I mean, because you say you want people want to please yes. him. Yes, yeah, yeah. He, um, and it's not like he's constantly belittling you. I don't want it to seem oh, like that. You know, but he'll, you know, how he normally does it is he'll be next to Chris Daly and, and like muttering to her, but for everybody to hear. They just can't get it right. But they keep asking me about this, this, but they can't get it right. And those sorts of things. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, there's praise involved. And, you know, um, the team this past year, one of the funny things they were telling us at the Final Four, because we asked them, like, do you have a team mantra or anything like that? Because some teams do. And, um, and, uh, and Nafisa Collier started laughing, and she said, well, yeah, it, it's, well, at least we didn't suck. She said, because, <laughs> she said, because one day at practice, they had a really good practice, and she said, and, and this coach is bringing him in, he like says sincerely, well, at least we didn't suck today. <laughs> and, uh, so the team would laugh about that. But no, there's absolutely encouragement, and there's praise, and there's teaching, and, and, and when he, he's working with you on something, when you finally get it right, he shows satisfaction, and for the players, you, you kind of crave that, you want that, and um, so absolutely, it's 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 not in any way an unhealthy relationship, but at the same time, he's very demanding of you mentally too, and um, it's not okay to do things right sometimes. You have to do them right every single time. That's hard to do. How did he um, encourage the girls to achieve academic success? Because that's been I think is he just doesn't, um, they don't tolerate you not. They, I think when, when you get, get to school, they understand what you're capable of, and then they hold you to that standard. And not everybody's capable of getting straight A's. Um, but if you're capable of getting B's, you better not get C's. And um, especially because there's so much support. There's tutoring, there's other things that are available to these women. So they just, you know, they're very aware of, of how the women are doing in class. They're very aware if they're not going to class and they make sure to hold them to that standard. First of all, thanks for sharing your many aspects of your life with us. And, and, and while you were clothed. Leave it at that. But uh, what, what role did Chris Daly play in uh, overall success? Uh, see, well, first of all, CB is, is a phenomenal yeah. recruiter. So you want to play, you want, I mean, it was different for me because this is before they had 11 national championships. So, um, so I wanted, I really wanted to play for Coach O'Hanlon. I really wanted to play for Chris Daly. I just enjoyed talking to them. They're just fun people to kind of get to know. Um, but she plays a huge role. Um, you know, she's kind of the one because he's so, you know, off the court. He's, you know, he's not usually on time to stuff. And um, and she is. You know, you're there five minutes early. She's the one who, you know. Before any function, CD, what's the dress code? You know, do we have to wear stockings? You know, we know we can't wear jeans, but this. And she's the one who's who kind of does all of that. She's the one. My freshman year, you know, pregame meal on the day of the game, we were traveling somewhere in a hotel, 
And um, all the seniors said, make sure you say thank you to the coaches on the way out because that's important to her. When you get on the bus, like, or you get off the bus, make sure you say thank you to the bus driver. And we really need to know the bus drivers. And the seniors would tell the younger guys that because those are the things that were important to Chris Bailey. Make sure you look somebody in the eye when you talk to them. If you're signing an autograph, ask for somebody's name. Like she, those are the kind of things that she brings to the program outside of just basketball. And then she's also in charge of the post players. So, um, so you know, she she takes a lot of pride when they have success at that position, and they've had a lot of it. But she's a huge, huge part, and just it's such a perfect complement to him. Their personalities are so different, and um, but they complement one another so well. Long time ago, uh, President Hartley was at a meeting with us department heads. He was very tense. We were real mad at him for some reason. But he was all head over heels happy the night before this bill had passed the General Assembly, UConn 2000. Uh -huh. Those beautiful pictures of Rome Hall were going to be real. And every single person in UConn, outside of UConn, knew what had made the difference. Uh -huh. It was the success of that team of yours. Uh, you know, there have been UConn national champions before, men's soccer, I'm almost certain, and polo, but yeah, you know, your team really was the big deal and captured everybody's imagination and made UConn politically popular and saleable in the General Assembly. So you're responsible for <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I like to tell that to President Hurts. <laughs> it's funny because I'm on the Board of Trustees now and, and, and yeah. have been on since I was pregnant with my oldest, so for over 14 years. And uh, and Tom Ritter has been on that whole time, and he was the speaker back when UConn 2000 was passed. And so he's um, he's told me stories a few times of how important the UConn women's team's success was to that. And it's amazing to me, I graduated in 95, and, uh, and when I come back, I'm like, this place is so different. The town sprouted up. Like, how did that happen? Or look at all these beautiful buildings, and. And, um, and it's amazing. It's funny because I sort of saw the transformation of the UConn women's program and the university at the same time. And I was being recruited junior in high school. It was like 1990-ish. Gamble Pavilion had just opened. And I can remember coming up to games and not all of the bleachers were pulled out for the women's games. And you could get into the women's games for free. Parking wasn't that hard. And, uh, and then to see it grow and what really changed, at least for us players, my junior year, we were really good. Um, and CPTV put one of our games on, and it did well. And so all so CPTV, the end of the year, put a bunch of our games on. And we literally, it felt like overnight to us, this is maybe spring break time, so almost NCAA tournament, we'd stay out in one of the hotels um, by, by Buckley Mall. And, we could, and before those games were on CPTV, we could go to the mall, and people would look at us because we were a bunch of tall women, and Carol Walters, my teammates, six, seven, you know, we're walking around, whatever. Couple games on CPTV, we're at the mall and people are stopping us, asking us for our autograph. <laughs> CPTV and giving the state of Connecticut access to our team was a huge factor in the popularity. And then for that to roll into my senior year, um, where we went undefeated, it just everything um, kind of was a perfect storm that all came together. How'd you get involved with um, broadcasting? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's funny when I went to school because even. The WMA didn't start until 1997. So when I was um, pursuing my degree, there was no professional basketball, except there was in Europe. You could earn a decent living over there. So my I'm a political science major, my plan was to graduate, play overseas, earn enough money to come back and go to law school. And, um, and then all of a sudden everything happened. And it went from a handful of women's games on TV to having a a decent sized inventory of games and ESPN being local approached me and said, you know, I actually I think it was my senior year, I said, you know, I could get inter interested in broadcasting. No, I haven't taken a single class. <laughs> um, and ESPN knew that and so once they started showing games, they asked me to do some. So I did some before I retired. And then when I retired from the WNBA in the summer after the summer of two thousand and three, um, ESPN said, All right, would you like to they started me as a sideline reporter on WNBA. And then I was the sideline reporter for college. And then once I got um, a lot of those opportunities, then I got to start doing color commentary and then got in the studio. And now I get to do both. And it's an absolute blast. But um, I kind of like the rest of my basketball life. It just <laughs> happened because of a very fortunate timing. Yeah. Um, 
has the has she run uh, run any coaching classes? I mean, he was such a phenomenal coach. I would think that would be natural to him. Do you know anything about? Him? I know if if coaches yeah, at any level, so high school yeah. or college or WBA, if they call him and want to come and spend some time, they're absolutely welcome to come. I think he speaks at some coaches clinics, like around the country, they'll get coaches clinics and a bunch of different coaches will speak. Um, but he's always very open to um, other coaches coming and learning from him. I can remember six or seven years ago, you know, when they're, in, or even when they're in the midst of the Brianna Stewart years, where, you know, in the midst of winning four in a row, they've won eight, nine, <coughs> 10 championships, saying to him, you obviously know what you're doing. How many coaches <laughs> Come and watch you, and he said, "Very few." That's changed. I think over the last yes. six or seven years, more people have asked, and they always say yes. And now coaches will come and, and watch what they do. Um, how have the relationships that you established with the likes of Jim and so forth? How have they helped you over the years? Um, well, just some of my best friends. Uh, I talk about the, my teammates with that UConn team where some people talk about the kids they grew up with or went to high school with. You know, we really spent three or four years together um, you know, working really hard for a common goal at, at very formative years in your lives. Um, yeah, I was actually texting with Jen earlier today. Um, she's down in Washington, D.C. now. She's head, head coach at George Washington University after having a ton of success as a head coach at the University of Hartford. And, um, but it's, it's one of those relationships that with a bunch of my teammates, I feel kind of, you know, like they're family. Even if I haven't seen something for a while, as soon as we're together, everything falls back into place. Um, but Jen was my was one of the people that I was absolutely most close to throughout our years at UConn. She was a year younger than me, but um, yeah, she's just such a great, great friend. And she looked up to you a lot. <laughs> yeah, physically, she did. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a good ticket to get. Yeah. Yeah. I was in the nosebleed seat. That's okay. There was someone screaming up there. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> Probably couldn't from where I was. Yeah. But uh, I know the Australians were horribly depressed that they were just going for bronze um, rather than being able to be in contention for mm -hmm. gold. Yeah, USA Australia, but there were six members of the UConn team on it, so I know what you mean. Oh, there were. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, the grouping is a big part of it. So say Australia is the be second best team in the world, right. but they're, if they're in the pod with UConn, then they're going to lose before a chance to play for the gold medal. Right, yeah. and, um, and that can happen. Australia is a very good international team. Um, the, the international teams are getting better. Mm -hmm. They're getting better. Um, I mean, US is still number one, but um, it's not... It's the, the, the gap is closing. Yeah, the preliminary game is close. Yeah. I yeah, they're, they're, they've got some really talented players. Spain's pretty good. There's some good international teams. I have about five questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, number one, a question about the um, uh, WNBA and it being televised. I mean, the women's basketball being televised on SMY not happening next year. Right. And, and, and it's going to be gone, just like CPT left and went to SMY. And I, don't, I don't know any more than you do about that, other than there was, I was given the sense that there's a feeling that an agreement will be reached between ESPN and SMY, which I hope, because I, I asked, I was speaking to a group the other day and I asked this question, how many of you have watched a game on ESPN Plus? <laughs> Yeah, they that, paid yeah, that's <laughs> well. That, that's the exact same response I got to the other group I was talking to. Now, if you get ESPN, ESPN Plus comes free. Well, no, if, if you do get it, or if you don't get it, I get it. Four ninety nine a month. For in addition to your I don't think that's true. I think, but I'm I'm not hundred percent sure. My my belief is that if you get ESPN that you can also stream through ESPN Plus on your device. Oh. And it's a, and it's a relatively easy thing to do. You go into an app, 
push a button, like I just put in women's basketball. It's not so easy. And then, <laughs> yeah. No, no, I, I completely understand that. And that's, and that's the point, the thing I'm getting to, because I was having this conversation with the people at ESPN, they said, this is so easy, this is the way it goes. I said, it's not easy for the people who watch women's basketball. Our demographic is different. Yeah. And, like, when my daughter wants to watch basketball with me, I don't want to watch it here. I want to watch it <laughs> on my television. Yeah. And, um, and so, like, even my kids, I see that they experience sports in a different, very different way than I did. They don't watch full games. They watch highlights of yeah. stuff. Oh. And everything they watch is here. And I, I don't personally like that. No, I don't want each of you watching something different here. I want us all watching something there. Um, I, I'm, I'm still hopeful that, that ESPN and SNY will come to an agreement and people will still be able to watch on SNY. If that doesn't happen, and you want to be able to watch UConn women's basketball, it's once somebody shows you how to do it, um, it's not difficult. And it's even not difficult <laughs> to get it up on your TV too. But um, it, you know, it's, it's just like anything. Like stuff happens and I'll say to my eight year old, my screen's locked or something, I don't know what to do, and give me that mom and she'll, she'll figure it out. But, but I'm still hopeful that SNY and ESPN come to an agreement. Yeah. That would be the best thing for everybody. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah uh, just a comment. I have watched UConn when I'm in another state on ESPN app. Yeah. Many times. Um, and uh, I don't know if that is ESPN Plus. Yes, it is. Okay. Great. Yeah. And, and you're right. Um, I have a Fire Stick, and I've used that to download the app, and it's really good. Once you learn how to do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's a Fire Stick? <laughs> <laughs> no, and... <laughs> What's that? I have a question. Yes. Can you compare today's college students when you were a college student in basketball? How have they changed? Uh, we all know they're probably a little faster. And maybe Are you talking about more skilled? So I'm not comparing the student. I'm comparing the athlete. Because yeah. where I was going was like when I was at UConn. You know, we came back from the national championship. Jen Rosati and I were like, we're going out tonight. It was like a Wednesday night. I said, people are going to be going crazy celebrating our championship. We went out. We were the only two people out <laughs> in class. Like, <clears throat> the other students didn't care. You know, I think that, that part has changed a little bit. The women's team has seen, like, the men's team was, when I was here, you know, kind of like stars. Bigger, faster, stronger players now wow. okay. than... I mean, the, the athlete from 20 years ago to now, and we had some really good athletes then, there's just a lot more of them now. And, um, and if, for those of you who haven't watched a WNBA game or haven't watched the Connecticut Sun game, I encourage you to. Uh, I mean, they're really, it's, it's a whole different level. Like people who say, you know, a UConn or a really, any really good college team could compete with a WNBA team, they can't. The WNBA is that good. And, um, and if you go, for example, if the New York Liberty come up to play the Connecticut Sun, I think New York has four or five former UConn players on it. So Brandon Stewart's hurt, but Seattle still has Sue Bird and Colleen Lasqueda Lewis. You can see some of your favorite um, former UConn players, but I encourage you to go to the WNBA game. They're reasonably priced. Parking is easy at the casino. Um, it's, it's a great place to watch a game. Mm -hmm. Rebecca. Oh. Yes. I'm always impressed, particularly during the final four, on the amount of preparation you must have to go through to be able to analyze the teams in the depth that you do, so frequently and so on. Do you do some preparation prior to, even though there's so much change? I yeah, yeah, that's... really have to have a lot that, of background. Um, yes. <laughs> and, and especially for me, now that I'm in studio, we have to have a breadth of knowledge of every team that we might be talking about. And so on a typical Sunday, I'm in Bristol, and there's a triple header. And one might be a Big Ten game, one might be a UConn versus South Florida game, and one might be an ACC game or an SEC game. But during the half times of those, we have to be prepared to talk about everything. So um, when I'm not in Bristol or if I'm not out calling a game, I, I consider myself having not quite a nine to five job because I leave the house at three to pick up my kids from school, but a nine to three job where I'm watching games, I'm reading newspaper clips from teams all over the country. And then once the NCAA tournament starts, you know, it's, there's 64 teams. I better be able to talk about all of them. And when the selection show happens, I better be able to talk about the ones who didn't get in and the ones who did get in. So, um, so when my little, when my daughter said, I didn't know if the boys played basketball too, that's because 
I'm spending so much time um, watching uh, women's basketball. I had what was different this year is my, my oldest daughter played basketball. Um, she goes to Northwest Catholic in West Hartford, and uh, she played mostly JV but some varsity. And when tournament time came, they're looking at their opponents they're going to play. They would get footage of one of their opponents' games, and she'd be at school, but I'd have her like iPad code, and I'm supposed to be watching Notre Dame right now, but instead I'm watching East Hampton or somebody. I'm fascinated, like, how, are, how is Northwest Catholic going to match up with these guys? So uh, my, my attention can be divided, but um, yeah, I watch it, and I enjoy it, but I watch a ton. That's why I know how to use the app so well. <laughs> Which game am I watching today? Okay, it's this one, I'll watch it. So, uh, and that's a nice thing if, if you're interested in watching any other team. You know, well, UConn's gonna play a team from California next week. Well, you could watch one of their last games on that app if you have any interest in doing that. I'm probably the only one who does. <laughs> <laughs> no. Anyone who hasn't, she has. Uh, I just was wondering how old were you before you got to play basketball with other women or girls? Oh, that's a good question. It was the year after. So it was uh, third grade was when I played with all the boys, I think, and then the following year, I was able to play, but I wasn't with kids my age. I was playing with kids uh, a grade or two older. So they had enough kids who wanted to play at that point, and so I played with them, which was good because I got to play point guard. Because that was like the only girls team I was ever on where I wasn't the tallest one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Could you tell me what you think the future is in salary for female basketball? Sure. WNBA team? So WNBA, the season, like I said, goes from about um, Memorial Day to Labor Day. And the women in the WNBA, I believe the highest salary is $117,000. The number one pick will make this year like $44,000 for the season. Really? Now, when you compare that to the NBA, it's <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> when you compare it to another four month job, it's not. And. Um, the, the WNBA, their collective bargaining agreement, ends at the end of this season, so it's gonna be interesting to see what things happen. Now, some of the women, most of the women go overseas and play, and they can make um, pretty good money over there. The superstars, which there's a handful of them, can make maybe a million dollars in the wintertime playing over there. Um, but that's a handful, that's like three or four people. And the rest of them can make, make money. Um, the hard thing is I don't, I don't, I've never felt like there's NBA owners like sitting back smoking cigars, getting rich on the WNBA. I don't think that's what's happening. I think, but it feels like the popularity is growing. There's good fan support. Um, WNBA just added CBS Sports as a partner to broadcast games. So I think they're getting to the point, hopefully, where as more money comes in, the players will see more of that. Um, I don't feel like, um, any of these NBA owners are getting rich off of the back of these women. Um, but I feel like culturally, we're getting very close to a point where it's gonna become a cool, fun thing for a lot of people to wanna watch and go to and spend money on. And I'm, uh, I'm hoping that's the case. And once that happens, the women should benefit from that. Will, it, will it ever become winter instead of summer? The reason it started in the summer in the first place, there's two reasons. One was the arena availability. When WMA started, it was all NBA teams that then owned women's teams. But now I think it's six and six, or maybe even seven and five. So part of it was arena availability, but the bigger thing was television. In the summertime, television, you were watching some soccer and baseball. So there were opportunities for ESPN to show these games and other networks. In the wintertime, you've got men's college, women's college, NBA, um, NHL. There's a lot fewer, um, even with all the networks that we have, there's a lot fewer opportunities for WNBA to find a place on TV, and that's what drives it all, because that's what, where the, all the ad revenue's gonna be. Mm -hmm. So, no. Maybe, maybe they can start it a little earlier, end it a little later, but I think it will always be in the summer window. I've always wondered that don't other coaches study what Oriana's doing and try to teach themselves or so they can teach them their students. Sure. The style and the what technique that he yeah. coached was. They do, and I and, and But my question yes. is that <laughs> sorry, but my question is, and then you said that Gino does have people come and he does sort of help educate them. But then I say to myself, but then if he's educating them, he's also educating the opposing team. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I sort of wonder like 
One way, yeah, you'd expect some that? coaches to want to learn, but the fact that Gino's willing to teach them, I mean. There's, a, cu there's a couple things there. Um, one, yes, people will watch what they do and try to mimic it. And I often am watching teams from all over the country and I'll be like, oh, that's what UConn runs. Mm -hmm. But when UConn runs it, it doesn't look like that. Uh, so they try to do it. They did, one, they have different players. Two, they, it does, if somebody comes and spends a year with Coach Oriyama and learns as much as they can from him about how to coach, they're still not him. He is a unique personality. He is, he's special in what he does. He's better than everybody else at what he does. Other other coaches can draw up great plays and get you know get somebody open. What he does, you'll never see a player go to UConn who's a really high level high school player who stays there for four years who's not so much better when they graduate. You'll see that other places. Kids really good in high school goes there get a little bit better and then they graduate. His gets so much better because of how he challenges them to get the most out of themselves just does that better than anybody else. And ultimately, that's what it comes down to. And he doesn't worry about the competition that much. I don't think so. Because, <laughs> I, I mean, he knows. I think he, he's, he knows. He knows. I mean, he worries like, like he knew. He always worries about Notre Dame. Because they can score a bunch of points, and Muffet's a really good coach, and they're always a really good team. So he worries about them. I mean, to the point where, like, he's miserable day of games. <laughs> but... He's not scared to teach someone and make try to make them better so that they can make their players better. Because I think he always feels like, you know, these his his players are still going to get it done. By the way, they had a remarkable year this year. Like for them to be in the Final Four was a, a great feat. Last two years, it was like people were saying, "Like, what's wrong with UConn?" Because the expectation was so high. I think this year, people were just like, "What a great season they had!" And they should have been. It was a great year for them. Oh, I think one more answer, one more start. At one point, Gino was advocating a lower height for the basket yeah. in the game. Yeah. Did he retract that idea, or was there really still I still have an answer to get out here. Um, he, he threw it out there, and I'll give him credit for this. He's trying to make women's basketball more popular in any way he can, and he's not afraid to throw out an idea like that. Why don't we try it? I think his idea was in the preseason when we have an exhibition game and one of those teams comes in, Let's, throw, let's put the rim down, yeah. and let's see, how much does it affect the three-point shot? If we have a kid dunk, how does that energize the crowd? Mm -hmm. Like, let's try it. And then, obviously, there's huge problems with it. You can't go around to every public park in the country <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and those things. But I, I like that about him. He said, all right, we need to get more people in the stands. Let's try something like that, even something out of the box. It's not demeaning women in any way. Let's just try it, and people like it. Let's try it again. If they don't, okay, we'll move on. And um, He's one of the rare, he's one of the few people who can say all kinds of crazy stuff. And uh, and he's earned the respect that people will listen to him. Okay, I'm done now. <laughs>